very warm welcome to our service of college prayers this evening when we celebrate, as we do annually in Hillary term, uh, Archbishop Robert Runcie, uh, one of our alumni, illustrious alumni. Um, Runcie was a student here uh, before and after the Second World War and uh, got a first in greats and he went on of course to be Archbishop of Canterbury, um, Bishop of St Albans, uh, Principal of Cudston Theological College. I'm going in reverse order backwards. Um, so we really celebrate his memory and his legacy too. And it's a real pleasure to welcome our guest preacher this evening. I can't really think of anyone more fitting uh, to give the sermon. Uh, so we welcome the Right Reverend and Right Honourable Lord Richard Charters, who was uh, Rontz's chaplain from 1975 to 1984 and then obviously went on to be Bishop of London uh, for a very long period uh, in that post until 2017. So it's a great pleasure to have you uh, speak to us tonight uh, to remember Runcy, but also to speak about uh, freedom, Christian freedom. As is usual, you'll find the responses to uh, the service, the praises and responses in the plain chant on the link below uh, the YouTube video, so you should be able to sing along if you'd like to at home. And you'll also find there the Just Giving website. Our chapel collections this term are going to Oxford Hospitals Charity to support the NHS. So as we come into God's presence together, a community uh, bound together virtually, but also spiritually, let us worship Almighty God. Let us confess our sins. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent, and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O oh Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouths shall show forth thy praise. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now, and never shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. 
The first lesson is taken from the first letter of Peter, chapter 2, beginning at the 11th verse. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and exiles to abstain from the desires of the flesh that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honourably among the Gentiles, so that, though they malign you as evildoers, they may see your honourable deeds and glorify God when he comes to judge. For the Lord's sake, accept the authority of every human institution, whether of the emperor as supreme or of governors, as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing right you should silence the ignorance of the foolish. As servants of God live as free people, yet do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. Here ends the first lesson.
This is from the Gospel of John, 8, 31 to 36. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. We say the Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
never liveth is counted dead before thee. Grant this for thy only Son, Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. Light in our darkness we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty and Heavenly Father, we desire thy loving kindness upon this our well-loved society. We implore thy blessing on its members, who now serve thee in their several callings. Strengthen them, O Lord, to serve thee as thou deservest, and, as thou hast called them to thy service, make them worthy of their calling. And we pray for ourselves, that we may learn here to know and to do thy will, that through thy protection, both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul, through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. O eternal God, the resurrection and the life of all them that believe in thee, trust in thee, and serve thee, now that art always to be praised, as well for the dead as those that are alive, we give thee most hearty thanks for our founders and benefactors, by whose bounty and charity we are brought up to religion and the studies of good learning, and particularly for Heath Harrison and John Ambrose Jupp, our benefactors, beseeching thee, that we may so well use these thy blessings to the praise and honour of thy holy name, that at last we with them may be brought to the immortal glory of the resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
bishop and archbishop. Lord Runcie was often called upon to address schools and other places of education, and more often than not he chose that extract from St Peter's first epistle, which we heard as our first lesson. Live as those who are free, not, however, as though your freedom provided a cloak for wrongdoing, but as slaves in God's service. In 1968, more than 50 years ago now, when I played my first hand of bridge with Lindy Ranzi in the vicarage at Cudston, the cry of freedom was reverberating around Europe. It was the year of Les Evénements. In May, the barricades had gone up in Paris and in other French cities, and the promise was of political change to complement the cultural revolution which had been gathering strength throughout the decade. Sexual intercourse began in 1963, which was rather late for me, between the end of the Chatterley ban and the Beatles' first LP. So said the poet Philip Larkin in his Annus Mirabilis. Even the Roman Catholic Church, on the very last day of the Second Vatican Council, voted to approve a declaration on religious freedom. The assembled fathers declared that human dignity required freedom from coercion in matters of religious belief. And it was a far cry from St Augustine's interpretation of the words from St Luke's Gospel, compel them to come in. Runcie himself was very much not a coercive personality. And this was one of his virtues which I admired then and admire now. I remember him as principal of Cudston Theological College, sitting light to the diktats of the latest theological fashions at a time when virtually the whole staff team had come to believe that salvation was to be found in group dynamics alone. He permitted them to experiment, but didn't expect too much. He had a bedrock confidence in a spiritual culture that was firmly rooted, but open to conversation and challenge. In a church that was neither afraid to reason, nor ashamed to adore. He was sceptical about dogmatic zealotry, whether of the orthodox or of the radical variety. I believe that the decisive experiences which contributed to Runce's moral compass came from his wartime service with the Scots Guards. His courage had earned him an MC, but far from boasting, it was a subject about which he was very reticent. He was commissioned in 1942, and as a tank commander, he experienced the whole Northwest Europe campaign until VE Day in 1945. He was one of the first British soldiers to enter the Bergen Belsen concentration camp. Occasionally he referred to incidents in those years when he was in his early twenties, especially the experience of comradeship and the loss of friends. As Napoleon said, to understand a man you have to know what was happening in the world when he was twenty. Runcie was part of a whole generation of people, prominent in the public life of our country, whose uh, humanity and respect for their fellow citizens was founded on their wartime experience of service. The Second World War was fought in the name of freedom, an idea powerfully articulated by President Roosevelt in 1941. He said, in the future days which we seek to make secure, we look forward to a world founded on four essential freedoms. The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. 
The second is freedom of every person to worship God in his own way, everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want, and the fourth is freedom from fear. The New Testament sets a high value on freedom. Jesus himself exhibited a remarkable degree of freedom from conventions. He was a religious teacher, but he was neither a scribe nor an ascetic. Foxes had holes, but the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. He had no fixed home, paid little special attention to his blood family, ate with all and sundry, and was unusually open to children and women, even Samaritans. By contrast, some versions of Christianity have been highly controlling and even coercive. There is a dramatic picture in Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov of the confrontation between Jesus Christ and the ecclesiastical hierarchy which sought to rule in his name. The scene is Seville, in the aftermath of the great auto da fe, in which a hundred heretics had been put to the torch. The Cardinal Inquisitor General recognises Christ in the crowd and packs him off to prison before he can intervene. They have a rather one-sided conversation in which Christ is silent, but the Cardinal complains about his irresponsibility and even lack of compassion for the millions of the spiritually second-rate. I tell you, said the Cardinal, that man has no more tormenting care than to find someone to whom he can hand over as quickly as possible that gift of freedom with which the miserable creature is born. Even when all gods have disappeared from the earth, they will still fall down before idols. And the Inquisitor reproaches Christ that instead of a firm foundation for appeasing human conscience once and for all, you chose everything that was unusual, enigmatic and indefinite. Anyone in a position of leadership would do well to revisit the prison scene in Karamazov on a regular basis. In the end, maintaining his silence, Christ simply kisses the old man on the lips and melts into the crowd. One of the key manifestos of 1520, in which Luther signalled his rebellion against the corruptions of the church, was entitled The Freedom of the Christian Man. It was shortly followed by events which horrified Christian Europe. In the city of Munster, civic and ecclesiastical government was overthrown and an apocalyptic sect, led by John of Leiden, seized power and chaos ensued. In 17th century England, after the abolition of censorship and the collapse of ecclesiastical control, there was a volcano of wild fanaticism. Even the revolutionary poet John Milton was moved to declare that liberty hath a sharp and double edge, fit only to be handled by just and virtuous men. The phenomenon of ideologically or religiously inspired terrorism has forced us also to think about the limitations of freedom. But contemplating Belson, as Runcie did in 1945, the evil of coercive ideologies and regimes was appallingly clear. And in the post-war period, in consequence, there were real attempts to enshrine in the law of nations protection for the freedom of the individual from external oppression. And the cry of the prophet Isaiah still needs to be heard today, with the vastly enhanced powers 
of the modern state to control all our lives. Proclaim liberty to the captives and let the oppressed go free. Christians have been allies in this campaign, but the Christian tradition also looks for freedom from enslavement to inner dispositions and cravings, which can lead to various kinds of addiction, to alcohol, drugs, sex, status, power and money. And all these things are substitutes for a deficiency in love and cannot be cured by simple prohibitions. Thou shalt not is an inadequate remedy when it comes to liberating the individual from such dangerous narcotics. Christian freedom, properly understood, rejoices in the emancipation of the individual from dependence and the entry into independence. But freedom shouldn't stop at freedom from coercion and various forms of enslavement. But it should lead on to freedom for self-giving love without hidden agendas or possessiveness. Dependence should give way to independence. And this is the essential precondition for the interdependence of loving relationships. Some of this will mean abridging individual freedom in the wider interests of society. We are communicating in this service today remotely at a time of proper restrictions on our individual liberty to protect our neighbours from a deadly disease. We should be watchful, however, that the new magisterium does not acquire too much of a taste for minute surveillance of all our lives. The alternative to freedom is to be the slave of destructive addictions or immobilised by fear. And the risk-averse life is just as diminished as the life in thrall to various kind of narcotics. Christian freedom rejects determinism and holds that choice is a moral reality. We are commanded to live as those who are free not, however, as though your freedom provided a cloak for wrongdoing, but as slaves in God's service. The New Testament version of freedom embraces freedom from coercion and freedom for loving relationships. The service of God, as we see him in his human face, Jesus Christ, brings in its train the freedom which emancipates us from various kinds of enslavement and possessiveness and makes us capable of loving relationships. His service is perfect freedom, as it says in one of the collects in the prayer book. This new life is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And as Paul says to the Corinthians, where the Spirit is, there is freedom. The Holy Spirit involves us through Jesus Christ in the uncoercive love of God. We share life in all its fullness through faith and love and are released from temporal controls, from wealth, from fear, from loveless addictions. The kind of freedom so often advocated in our own day freedom from external control, is only half the story. A full-blooded embrace of freedom involves seeking freedom from enslavement and possessiveness in order to be free for loving relationships. Universities are places where the future of society is being debated and incubated. It is vital that this college continues to be what it was when Runcie, newly returned from the war, 
was an undergraduate. A place where there is freedom to debate a wide variety of views in a community committed to living together with differences. Live as those who are free, not, however, as though your freedom provided a cloak for wrongdoing, but as slaves in God's service. It was a culture which, as Bishop and Archbishop, Runcy inhabited and exemplified. In the eight years during which I worked with him as closely as anyone, and in many years of friendship afterwards, I never knew him to use his power to stifle opposing voices or to punish those who disagreed with him. As a result, he frequently disappointed the zealots. But he deserves to be remembered here in the college which he loved. We pray for those in positions of authority, for leaders and members of all powerful institutions, and for ourselves, that we may have the courage and humility to be disciples of Christ in whatever organisation we are part of. O oh God, who has bound us together in this bundle of life, give us grace to understand how our lives depend on the industry the honesty and the integrity of our fellow men, that we may be mindful of their needs, grateful of their faithfulness, and faithful in responsibilities to them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray for those who are not free, for those serving sentences in prison, and for all those who feel trapped by financial situations, addiction, or mental illness. Almighty God, you have broken the tyranny of sin and have sent the spirit of your Son into our hearts, whereby we call you Father. Give us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service, that we and all creation may be brought to the glorious liberty of the children of God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for those struggling with uncertainty, for those whose faith is tested, and for those who find it difficult to trust and hope, and also for all those who mourn the loss of a loved one at this time. Almighty God, who hast in thy wisdom so ordered our earthly life, that we needs must walk by faith and not by sight. Grant us such faith in thee, that amidst all things that pass our understanding, we may believe in thy fatherly care and ever be strengthened by the assurance that underneath are the everlasting arms. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. May the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be with you now and always. Amen. Go forth in peace. Thanks be to God.
Thank you.